Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to the service of Emmanuel United Church of Christ found here in Dousman, Wisconsin, or wherever you might be joining us for this morning or whenever you might be watching with us. We hope that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you find a welcome and a community here. I did not open my thing up in time but we do like to start our day with celebrations. Is anyone celebrating anything particular this week? Mm. Yeah. Sunday school is starting again, which we're super excited about. Donna, do you remember? It'll be up in a second, I promise. Here we go. There's a new puppy this week. A schnauzer. Well, we look forward to meeting your schnauzer puppy on October 9th to bless it. We are celebrating 16 years of membership here in Emmanuel of, of Jeannie. Yay. And so we are grateful for your ministry in and among us in this space and outside of this space. Community beloveds, will you stand and join me for our call to worship? God brings us through the floods. Rejoice, for your God saves. Will you join me in prayer? Saving God, you promised Noah you would never destroy. Remind us daily of your intense love for your whole creation and help us to love as you love. Amen. Amen. Let us sing together. Old 
and young, each a gift and your creation, each a love song to be sung. Like a friend, O oh, fiery pillar, leading where the eagle star. We are people, ours the journey, now and never, now and never, now and never more. Should the threats of dire predictions cause us to withdraw in pain? Blazing Phoenix spirit resurrect the church again. I bring the fire to the leading where the people soar. We are people, ours the journey now and never, now and never. Let us come before God in a moment of honesty, um, confessing and admitting those places where we haven't always lived up to what we had hoped. God of promise, you have given us all we are and all we have, and still we have not trusted you fully. We have tried to be God in our own lives, hurting ourselves and those around us, in our attempts to control. Wash us clean in the waters of your salvation and bring us back into right relationship with you. Hear the good news. God welcomes you home with open arms and forgives you all your sins for the sake of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, live in the promise of God's love freely given. Amen. Amen. And let us share signs of peace with one another. <laughs> peace. <laughs> All right. Are you guys? Do you want to come up? Come on. Hello. How's it going? You're peeking in there already, huh? Are you excited to start some Sunday school again? Yes, I love that you're both wearing rainbows. Did you know we were gonna talk about rainbows today? No, ugh. It could be a coincidence, it could be a God thing. It could be. Well. We have a little bit of a story, but first it comes with some handouts. For you. For you. Yep. All right, so I'm gonna tell a story today. And as part of our story, People are gonna have feelings. Do you have feelings? Yes, absolutely. And so, you have to look or else I'll forget. Our red and our pink streamers, I have two red, I don't need that. Whenever we think there's a part in the story where somebody feels sad, we're gonna wave those. And then our yellow and our green and whenever there's a part in the story that you think sounds scary, we're gonna wave those. Yeah, are they scary though? No, not for us. And then whenever there's a part in the story that, that seems hopeful and exciting and good, yeah, we're gonna do the purple and the blue, okay? All right, are you ready? You can wave them any anytime or all the time. Okay. God had created a beautiful world 
and everything in it. I think that seems hopeful. I like it. God loved all of it, but the people God created were mean. Seems scary. Do you get sad too? I saw you reaching for those pink, the red one. I think it could be both, right? They forgot about God and they hurt one another. And the whole world was crying out in sadness. Mm -hmm. But God loved God's creation too much. So one man named Noah still loved God. So God asked Noah to save God's creation. He would send a flood to destroy the earth. What do you think? I oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the storm and the floods would be scary. But there was hope for God's creation. Noah would build a boat. And Noah would put on the boat two of all of the animals and some of the plants that God had created. What do you think? Yeah. Then the floods came. And when they were done, Noah freed the animals and planted the plants. And there was a new beginning. What do you think? Are new beginnings scary or hopeful? Yeah, I think so too. God put a rainbow in the sky with a promise that God would never flood the world world again. What do you think? Yeah. That's pretty hopeful. What was the scary part? Do you remember? The flood? Yeah. And what was hopeful? A lot was hopeful, right? And God's promise to always love the world is still and God's promise to never flood the earth again. Yeah. What is a promise? Have you ever made a promise? Yeah. And you do it. Yeah. Do sometimes do you break a promise sometimes? Sometimes. And sometimes we don't mean to, right? Yeah. Do you think God breaks promises? You do? What do you think? Sometimes. Oh, we all do. Yeah. Well, we hope God doesn't. Can we hope? Can we hope that? Can that be our purple blue? Yeah. Because God loves us so much. Did you hear what the sign was for our, did you hear what God put in the sky to remind a rainbow? So our whole next bunch of weeks, we're going to talk about promises that God makes. And each week is going to have a color. Can you guess what color this week is? Red. We'll go all the way through them. I had a couple of things for the day, though. What do you think one of the things we should do because God loves the earth so much? We should take care of it. Yeah. So this is our hand. What is, can you read what it says? Fragile. Handle with care. And then all of the states and the countries and some cities. Yep. We'll put that there. All right. Well, will you pray with, will you say pray with me? Dear God, Thank you for loving us, and thank you for your beautiful, colorful promises. Amen. Amen. Well, don't go anywhere yet. I forgot to change our sign. There we go. It's our first day of Sunday school, which is pretty exciting. We're glad you're here. It's kind of a, kind of a rainy day out. Do you think the world's going to flood? Not here. No, no. Someplace it might. Yeah. So we are going to do a little blessing. We're going to bless our teachers. Even if they're not all here, we're going to miss Kristen to come up. 
And yeah, you have a little part too. It's okay, we'll see it all up on there. I'm gonna stand up. Do you wanna stand up? You don't have to, but I feel weird to stay down. Uh. You'll get to meet Vivian and Leanne. Yeah. Our teenagers will sometimes teach you. I'm sure they're pretty much cooler than I am. So. Kristen's pretty cool, right? Yeah, yeah. Oops. We have Bibles for some of our kids. They're just not here today. Yeah, so next time. Jesus was brought to the temple as a child. And there, Simeon blessed him and his parents as the prophet Anna praised God. Scripture says that Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and favor of, and the favor of God was upon him. And here too is a sacred place where our children feel blessed by God, are encouraged to pursue wisdom and find support from a loving community to become instruments of blessing for other, others. And we mark the start of a new school year, and we pray for our young people and commit ourselves to supporting our children and youth, their families and teachers. Families who are guiding these young people, will you, and, and other young people too, providing these students and others with both encouragement and accountability they need to succeed in their individual and spiritual formation? Will you work for healthy communication and cooperation with your children, child's school? Will you recognize the potential within your children? Will you provide them with love and model for them, the self-discipline they need for that potential to be realized? Parents and families, we will? Yeah. Excellent. Our teachers, teachers who are educating these young people. And if you teach within our schools, which I know you're there, will you recommit yourself to enlightening young minds, ennobling young hearts? Will you speak hope? I probably have to change the page. There we go. Will you speak hope to the dispirited and inspire excellence in all? Will you let your life be the clearest lesson of all? Well, excellent. All right. This is the part for you guys. Are you ready? Students, look around. Look at all those people. All of those folks are praying for you and are committed to support you as you strive to grow into the God's fullness into your life. Will you honor God's gift to you by developing your minds and your bodies and your spirits? We will. You will. Excellent. And congregation, community, you who are like an extended family to our students, will you encourage our teachers, parents, and children? Will you lend your wisdom and support your time and your patience, your prayers and your resources to the communal work of guiding young people? Will you further commit to recognizing that all children in our wider community are our children. Will you seek ways to support quality education for every student? Mm -hmm. Excellent. May God bless all of us in the many ways in which we learn and we teach. Amen. Excellent. That is the end. You guys can go to Sunday school. Do you want to take your streamers with you, though? Do you want to take all the streamers with you? Yeah, do that. I know, I'm reading. <laughs> Good morning. Um, the, the scripture today is Genesis, chapter 6, verses 5 through 22, and chapter 8, verses 6 through 12, and chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. 
And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with the animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. These are the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jebeth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in the ark, cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its width, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and put the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I am going to bring a flood on the waters of the earth to destroy from heaven, from under heaven, all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything on earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you. And everything, every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to the kinds, their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every kind shall come into you and keep them alive. Also, take with you every kind of food that is eaten and store it up, and it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he made and sent out a raven. And it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent out the dove to, from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the earth. But the dove found no place to set its foot and it returned to him to the ark for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took it and brought it into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and there in its beak was a flesh freshly plucked olive leaf. So no one knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove, and it did not return to him anymore. Then the God said to Noah and to his sons, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal on earth with you, and as many as came out of the ark. I established my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is a sign of the covenant I make between you, between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on earth. Friends, listen to what these words mean to us today.
That probably needs a prayer. Are you joining me in prayer? Holy and loving God, may we struggle with your word. May it be a blessing to us and all that we meet in the world. Amen. Last year, a friend of mine posted a question on Facebook asking why a loving God would send a flood and then proceed to commit genocide. And then asked uh, all of his friends who work for churches or work for Christianity to answer it. My response was twofold. One was that we have to discuss the role of the Bible about how we interpret it, uh, its place in history. And the other answer was like, we just really like animals and they can be really cute. The story of Noah's Ark in art is really cute if you put it in a nice pastel color and it's just a bunch of animals looking over the side of the boat as they sail across the open waters. On the other hand, it is horrifying if you take this text literally. And the images of the things that are floating in the waters around them the story of Noah and the ark and the flood are some horrific combination of a children's story and an apocalyptic nightmare. And there are some who work really hard to prove that it is true. They do all kinds of math to prove that you could fill it with so many animals. And then they build the boat with the dimensions that are given in the text. And it turns out, even if you build the boat, it might not be seaworthy because the one they built in Kentucky <laughs> suffered some water damage from their last floods. And it seems that they do all of this with the assumptions that the most important thing that they are doing is convincing folks that it happened just like this literally in history that the Bible says, and it happened. And I disagree. I don't think that is the most important thing about this story. The story of Noah and most of Genesis fall into what we generally consider prehistory. There isn't really a time frame given. It's just sort of out there in the ether it's the myths of creation, of how and why the world is as it is. Who are these humans living on the earth? It is myth, and it is metaphor, and it is parable. And it tells the truth, even if it didn't happen this way. It tells us something about God. That might be a little bit scary. And it tells us something about humanity that might ring true still today, and it tells us something about creation. The story of Noah is a story of recreation. With word and breath and clay, God made everything and named it good. God made humans and they were complicated. From the very beginning, Humans wanted things. They wanted fruit. They wanted knowledge. They wanted affirmation. And we can look at each one of those things as they are mundane, even good food for sustenance and survival, knowledge for wisdom and understanding, affirmations because we all need love. But those desires have a downside, a negative extreme. Taking more than one needs or taking it from someone else, it makes sustenance that doesn't value another person. Knowledge that doesn't come with wisdom, but rather the ability to benefit from a system that benefits some and not others. And seeking affirmation and affection in a way that diminishes yourself or others 
through abuse, assault, or manipulation. There are ways to live with our desires well, and there are ways to live with them that are detriment to another. They can lead to violence. And one other translation says outrage. They might even look evil. As humans, we are capable of great good and great beauty, great creativity and great love, but we are also capable of great violence, great offense against each other, and great injustice. And God had made this whole creation good. And as time passed and God looked down at it, apparently from a distance, God saw the outrage and the violence of humanity. All that had been perfect and good had multiplied into evil. Did you know there's a whole collection of images of people trying really hard to make the same thing someone else made and failing miserably? They're often called Pinterest fails because Pinterest is the home of all wonderful things in the world until you try it yourself. These aren't mine, by the way. I'm not, I take no responsibility for that. Um, but I like to think of myself as creativity create a creative person, or I want to be. But the problem is I have these great ideas in my head, and there's no drawing and almost no photograph I take, and nothing real, no craft I do, no writing I do that quite comes out the way that it is in my head. Bob Ross says that there are no mistakes, only happy accidents. But they feel like mistakes when I look at them, and they're disappointing. And I wonder if that's what God thought about the work of creation, that it wasn't quite the way they had planned, that it wasn't a happy accident anymore, but that really there had been a mistake. God decides to paint over the canvas or shake the etch-a-sketch. And it's wild to think about God having made a mistake, or at least believing that God had made a mistake. But this is a story of a God who regrets and then makes mistakes and then regrets and starts over again. The very first thing that God does in our story is make a plan to wipe the slate clean, to destroy everything. The very second thought of God is to preserve something, preserve people and animals. And while it's God's first thought goes to destruction, the second one is way longer with detailed instructions on how to salvage it. God spends significantly more time telling Noah how to save the world rather than how it's going to be destroyed. See, I imagine God like a parent on a road trip with their kids, and it's hour two, and you have eight more to go. And yet, it's gotten overwhelming, and your first response is to yell for them to be quiet for just like five minutes. And you may do that, and then you remember your better self, and that these are children, and they're your children, and they're just going to be loud. And they're going to be full of questions. And no one likes to sit still for a long time if they're not in charge of the radio. And they're curious. I imagine when you're trying to teach your children something because they want to be helpful and they have to learn things, but they do it wrong. <laughs> and you can respond with frustration or you can respond with grace, because they aren't going to do it the same way you would. And that might be OK. And to be honest, this is a grace we should probably extend to our significant others, <laughs> to other people in our lives, our coworkers. Like, they're not going to do it exactly the same way you are. And that's going to be OK. See. 
When the rains were over, when the water had cleared, and they returned to where they lived, when Noah and the family and all of the creatures had found their way back to the land, God took a deep breath. Noah had built an altar. God breathed in the fragrance and realized humans aren't going to change. God was just about to tell Noah to go forth and to multiply just like God had told them to earlier in this way earlier in the story for other humans and they are going to multiply evil just like they did before. There would also be good and there would be desires that lead people to goodness and there would be desires that lead people to evil and God as if God had a really good therapist said humans aren't going to change so I'm going to have to God was going to have to take a different approach than the one that would see creation as something observed from afar off that is supposed to be perfect God is going to need to not get so caught up in the perfect in the perfection that they miss the good. God realizes that violence isn't going to fix violence and that a second mistake isn't going to fix the first. And so God hangs their bow in the sky, God's weapon. It's God's first thought of destruction. And they hang it in the sky as a reminder, not to humans, but for God's self, as a reminder to not start with the idea of the world functioning perfectly, but to start with relationship. God makes a covenant with the whole of creation because God is choosing to work with the world that we have here with these people and these creatures, even if they aren't perfect, and even if they do wrong, even if they choose violence and outrage, this is the world God has chosen. And that is who God has become after the flood. The God who would make a covenant with creation, with the people and the animals, the ones that fly and crawl and swim with every tree and every flower. The God that we see after the flood is the one who gives guidelines and teaches the ways of compassion and justice. It is the God who sets the captives free, who gives them enough to live, who heals and forgives. It is the God after the flood who will come to earth in flesh and show us what love looks, out, looks like when it's lived out. This is the first of many commandments and promises, agreements that God makes with human, humans and the earth. And those are the ones we'll look at this fall and winter. But the question is, who do we become after the flood? The flood is the symbol of one world ending and a new one beginning. Who do we become when our world has ended? There is recreation and there is resurrection. There is life after the world ends. So who are we going to be in the midst of it? It could be anything. Our world ending could be anything. It could be global and it could be really personal. It's the end of a relationship. And that vision of who you are and who you are going to be in the future that was connected to that one person and all of the hopes and all of the plans and they're all gone and they will never be. That is a world ending. But it could be the loss of a job or your home or a family member, a friend, a move. It could be the loss of an ideology, a belief system, an election. Who do we become? when our world ends? Do we turn into ourselves? Do we choose anger, outrage? Do we settle and live in regret? 
Our world is in the midst of floods and disasters, droughts and fires. Whole homes and towns and ways of life are being destroyed as islands disappear underwater. Who do they become? And who do we become in the midst of it? Do we stand here in our safe place, believing that while it rains today, it will not flood? Feeling blessed and separated from those around the world and down the street who are suffering and struggling? Do we respond in grief and anger? Do we just live in that? Do we choose violence when our world ends? 21 years ago, today, in many ways, one world ended. At the end of the Cold, the end of the Cold War brought an optimism that was the 90s, my golden years right there. And the optimism of the 90s came crashing down in New York City on this day in 2001. In many ways, who we became when the world ended were people who wanted to do good for each other, whom were moved in kindness and were connected. And for a brief moment, we hung our bows, promising unity. And then very quickly, we grabbed them back and we have lived with that consequence for the last 20 years. It's not just war, but it is abuses heaped upon anyone who looked Middle Eastern, of any religion. Who do we become? And we have lived, are living, forever living through a pandemic that was kind of world ending. And for a moment, it seemed like we were coming together as a humanity. And yet it still seemed like maybe that coming together was way shorter than it's ever been. But we are still figuring out who we are going to be on this side of the world ending. Who will we become? You and me and all of us together, we're not the same. We can't go back to 21 and one day ago. And we can't go back to January 2020. The floods have come and the world as it was has ended. And we've changed too. And we are going to multiply something whether it is community or division, gratitude or greed, generosity or accumulation. And the church has a unique place in the world, even if we, the universal church, have often failed to live into it. We have a unique place to be the place where all kinds of people come together with a promise that we are going to choose relationships over perfection. We're going to choose relationships over outrage and violence. We're going to choose to honor God's relationship and covenant with all of creation instead of manipulation and exploitation and neglect. We are going to see God as our example, naming our mistakes and making a plan to do better for each other. Who are we going to be after the world ends? Is there something you need to hang up to remind yourself to choose relationship over perfection and anger? Is there a community that needs to be cared for? Is there somebody who needs community? Because this is one of the reasons why we have church, why we gather together, or as often as we can, to nourish each other, to care for each other, to choose relationship over perfection. We learn to grow and learn and become together. We struggle with ideas and we still choose each other. And the reason 
It is the reason that we expand and we extend and we invite and we reach out to others because it isn't to force them to believe what we believe, but it is because we are better, all of us, in community. We are more likely to choose good when we have each other to count on. So, who are we going to be after the flood, after the world ends? May we be church, a church that is a community over division, that chooses gratitude over greed and generosity over accumulation. May we be people of God who make mistakes and learn from them and grow that that God, our God, may be our example to always choose relationship. And so may we live and may we learn in love. Amen. But as we prepare for our next hymn, you have two pieces of red paper. On one, and there are extras if you want more than one, I'm gonna invite you to write a prayer. Maybe it is a bow that you're gonna hang up or a person or a place where the world has ended and they're waiting on hope of resurrection and recreation. And we're going to make a paper chain out of them. And we're going to add to it every week of our prayers. The other one you're going to take home. Put it in a place where you will see it throughout the day or throughout the week. We're going to add colors to it each week. And on that one, take a word, write a word, a word you're going to carry with you this week and into the weeks ahead. And so may those words, may those prayers be a blessing. Um, we'll either collect the prayers in our bowl or we'll bring them together at the end of service. Uh, you're welcome to lift up those prayers during our prayer time. Shall I stand? 
We come to our time of prayer together. Um, knowing that our prayers are, our burdens are lightened when we share them, our joys are multiplied when we share them together. And so this week, our congregational prayers are for the Obenberger family, for Vera and Don Ortman. Uh, continued prayers of healing for Chris recovering from her hip surgery, uh, for Fran and Ken Pike, for my sister Jessica, for Sandy Horn's sister Jay, uh, Gail, for Jerry Marheim, uh, for Corinne's sister-in-law Carola and friend Joanne, for Greg Jarrett, uh, for Jeannie's cousin John Patrick, for Ron Blachek's sister Joan, and Steve Thompson's friend Carl. Are there other prayer requests this morning? Yeah, Kathy. My sister Elizabeth and niece Gertie, she has broken cancer. We're talking about her. Randy so, Smith. Yeah, Jenny. Um, I have a praise and a prayer request. My dad had his first eye surgery last Wednesday at Seaton Funnily Well. He's got a cataract in glaucoma. Um, the, the right eye that's coming up this Wednesday, the glaucoma's a lot worse. So we're concerned about um, some of our He's just rejoicing and being able to see colors and, and contrast so much better than he had for a long time. Absolutely. Jenny's dad, a celebration of the first good eye surgery and prayers for a good second on the other. That he may, yeah, seeing all of the colors and that'll be wonderful. Yeah, Kathy. Uh, Sue and Tom Stilling will be coming back this week. So prayers for them and have a wonderful. Absolutely. The Stellings are coming home this week uh, from, from, I was going to say, from sailing. I don't know why that requires bird motions, but that's what I got. We continue to hold our world in prayer for those living in the midst of and under the threat of violence, for those living um, with too much water without enough water, um, with fires. Uh, there was, I put the picture up of Pakistan. Pakistan had a significant um, monsoon level rains in the last week and those were devastating. Um, so all of the places and prayers, yeah. The people of England who've lost their queen. Absolutely. That it's going to be different. Yeah. For those grieving and for those who are transitioning in their respective roles or leadership responsibilities. We hold in prayer our, our shut-ins. Shut uh, Sharon Logeman and Vera Ortman, and will you will you join me in prayer for the church, for the world, and for all those in need? Faithful God, you saved Noah and his family, along with all the animals and the sources of food from destruction by a flood. Remind us daily that we are inheritors of your mercy. 
All of creation thrives because you are a God who creates rather than destroys. Show us how to nurture all that you have made so that it may continue to thrive for generations to come. Grant your wisdom to our world's leaders so that they may treat your earth with kindness and mercy. Shower your beautiful creation with healing of body, mind, and spirit. Take care of all those who suffer, those we have named, and those who remain unnamed in our hearts. Give those with means the desire to share generously with those who have little or nothing. Balance this world with mercy and justice. With gratitude, we remember the saints for their leadership in creating beauty in this world. Trusting in your grace and mercy, we lift these prayers to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples and us to pray to God, who is both our mother and our father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. take all that we have been given and we offer it back in gratitude. Our offering bowl is in the back with our small singing bowl. Um, our offering supports the mission and ministry of Emmanuel here in this community and beyond. Our singing bowl is support this month of September is benefiting Emmanuel's Congregational Care Fund. The fund is used to help support members of this church and of the community who are finding themselves in need of assistance, whether that is uh, financial for rent, gas, or I suppose gas is also the gift cards. We do gift cards uh, or food. Um, so, wrong one. Hey, it's coffee hour. There's coffee hour and like a whole thing full of treats. So stick around, enjoy some of the treats. Um, down the hall. This week I will be out of the office. And so uh, there will be no Bible study. And I won't be at the coffee shop Thursday morning. And we're not having our Friday fire, um, which means hope we'll do one more in October. So like, let's, let's do it in October. Um, so ignore the little fire. But Next Sunday, uh, Peter St. Martin will be preaching, which will be excellent. Um, so come on, bring a friend. There's lots of ways to be involved. Uh, look in your bulletin, look in the announcements. Um, I'll take volunteers to help run the, the camera. Right now, we really only have one person who's able to do it. And so when she's not here, I do it by myself, which is why it did not work out today. So Melissa will be here next week. You could just hang out and see what she does. Um, and I made a video for how to turn everything on. It's great. We have a couple of other announcements for our day. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
been out there with um, a chance to sign up for free meals. We have, at this point, four adults and five children, and we would like to fix a meal for them uh, three times, so three meals. So if you have a chance to do that and you love to cook, that would be a great thing to do for the service for others. Absolutely. Uh, we're continuing to support Family Promise, not through housing them here, but supporting um, other ways in which our families in the Waukesha County are getting reestablished, getting their feet on the ground. And so part of that is offering ministry of food, which is like the primary way of doing ministry in the Bible, like Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus, everybody. It's like hang out and eat food together. So find the sign up. Are there any other announcements today? Excellent. Let us offer a prayer of gratitude. All of creation is yours, gracious God. Accept these gifts, which we return to you with gratitude for the sake of the world. Amen. Amen. Will you stand as you are able for our closing hymn in body or in spirit? Beloved community, may you know that when the world ends or your world ends, it's not over. We are people of resurrection and hope and new life. May you carry that hope and new life into the world. May you spread that love and hope to all that you meet. May they know there is life beyond this moment too. Go in peace. Amen.